slash and cast. All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor and martial artist Ludi Lin about his childhood, Final Fantasy, anime, Liu Kang, Mortal Kombat, and more. And if you're listening to this and you feel so inclined, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Helps us show up on the algorithm. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature One overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. (laughs) I want you to take us back in time to when you were a kid. You know, were you a book reader? Were you a fort builder, troublemaker, or were you all of the above? Oh man, that's a great icebreaker. Uh, so <laughs> run that by me again. A book reader, a fort builder, a Tr- troublemaker. <laughs> a troublemaker. <laughs> all of the above. And all of the above. I was I think every kid's probably all of the above. But if I was to rank it in, in um you know how prevalent I am in each of those categories, I would say probably <laughs> it probably depends on who you ask. <laughs> I, I, I did read. A, I did read a lot. I had this. Uh, so I, I was born in China, and I had this encyclopedia for kids ever since I could remember. It was called Ten Thousand Questions Why," and I read that again and again and again. And even back then, I remember reading about like climate change in it. What would happen if all the ice in Antarctica? melted we'd all be underwater and i thought about that over and over and over again and then i would probably be a troublemaker after that because i do remember getting yelled at a lot when i was a kid <laughs> and then a fort maker i didn't have too many materials to build forts with so that would be the last one i love the idea of building a massive sand castle i always saw those as like great pieces of art but uh, i've never had the chance to do it myself now, did you game a lot growing up, or was that never sort of in your realm? I did video game a lot, since I could remember. Because we had those, I don't know if you remember those, like, classic little handheld. They're not actually Game Boys. They're kind of like rip-off of Game Boys that had 150 games in one little system. Did you have that? No, no, I'm not even, I don't even like, know what that is. It's, like, it's got, like, Tetris, Snake, anything you could do with all, uh, like, very simple pixelated graphics, you know? Damn. So we had those in China. And then I discovered the wonderful world of, you know, Nintendo and Sega, where it's all colored and, and interactive. So that was really fun. And from there on PlayStation, I think I did stop at PlayStation, PlayStation 2. I had a GameCube. I have a Wii now. But yeah, Sony wise I stopped at PlayStation 2. And then I think that was the end of my very serious gaming. I think on PC games, it carried on for a little bit after that. And Counter-Strike just lasted forever. But um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure kids hearing this now, they're like, oh, how <laughs> old is this guy? Counter-Strike. But I remember skipping school to play Counter-Strike. That was, uh, that was a hoot. Well, so what were some of your favorite PlayStation games? Do you remember what you were playing? Yeah, definitely. Definitely like um, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, As always, been a classic. I played that a lot. What else? Wipeout? Wipeout XL? No, there's some good PlayStation games. Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, man, I love pretty much every Resident, Final Fantasy that's been released. Resident Evil. Yeah, Final Fantasy was was the cat's paws. You know they just remade 7 recently. I haven't played it, but it's out there. Yeah, I heard. And I think there's like different spin-offs now, aren't there? Yeah, they struck gold on that one, man. Yeah, yeah. So, Ludi, were your parents involved in the arts at all? Do you have a eureka moment to where you kind of sort of fell into that? I grew up with my mom. So my mother was into the arts, but then she was forced out of the arts Mm. because she had to emigrate and and make money for the family. And then the arts wasn't really looked upon fondly in my family. It's more like practical. And then ironically, she perpetuated that that, that sentiment onto me when I chose to to be in the arts, especially the film arts for a career. She heavily tried to dissuade me from doing that yeah and it didn't it didn't she didn't she didn't succeed so that, 
she's probably glad she didn't succeed. Sometimes she's glad. Sometimes she's still, yeah, very worried and still tries to dissuade me from time to time. But That's what parents do. You know, that's what they're there for, to worry for us. That's right. That's right. When do you join the stage and when do you start actually taking part in theater? I always say that I think every single kid joins the stage from the moment they're born, at least from the moment they pick up a toy and start role playing. Like, I don't know. I don't know what little babies think when they pick up those like little shaker toys. But I imagine that they're, they're thinking that they're like some sort of um, cave baby, you know, like cave <laughs> or rock and the things. Or if they're game on a stroller, they might not know what a uh, race car driver is. But I imagine them to be thinking that they're in this in this vehicle and they're propelling themselves forward and imagining all sorts of things. So I think we we play all sorts of roles as soon as we're born and we love role play when we're children. I I know I did. I used to, you know, a a big towel and pretend I was Superman. I didn't even know. I don't think I even knew what Superman was then in China, but I certainly know that I would, if I had a cape, I could fly. But as a, as a serious career, I mean, I did um, theater performance in university as well as as well as going to med school. But that's when it really seriously started, and it's 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 been great. It it's been great because it's so different than what I initially thought it was. Right. It's such a good surprise. So when you're on stage and you're playing a character, does your approach change at all if you're on screen? Yeah. There's a big difference. I think on screen, a lot of things, I feel like it's it's a lot more analytical, even while being in the moment, because you have so many takes and so many tries. There's a lot more collaboration and discussion of the character with like ongoing discussion with the director and with different departments. It's a lot more fun in that way. It's, I feel like it's more cohesive art in terms of film compared to theater. I mean, we all watch a screen and it's all presented in front of us in its in its final rendition. But while you're making it, you have to go in between each single thing, like each little thing that you see on screen, there's been a discussion about it. Yeah. If there's a candle in the background, there's been, you know, 50 discussions about what type of candle. If we light it, where's the fire safety department, like the arts department, the production design, the director, everyone has to get involved. So you really have to go out of your way to make those things happen. So it's a, it's very nuanced. It's, I don't know, in some ways it's a bit more scientific and maybe, maybe that appeals to the, to the scientific side of my mind. Yeah, still a student just beginning. Right, right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you moved from China to Australia when you were nine. Yeah, that's right. Do you remember that being difficult for you, culture-wise? Yeah, that was really, really tough. Everything, thank God we have this episodic memory that we we can look back on things and not experience the pain, but still enjoy the results of it. Because in hindsight, of course, it did a lot of good for me. A lot of, um, I, I, I definitely received a lot of benefits from being on my own, learning how to be independent and uh, learning English. And just even more than that, just being receptive to, to living in a, another culture and compare that to the one that I was born with mm-hmm. and just reap the benefits from both and compare and contrast. So, but yeah, it was grueling, it was difficult. Didn't speak the language, it was away from family. It feels it felt like I was being ostracized and back then it wasn't it's not I mean it's not easy to fly to Australia now it's like a 20 hour <laughs> flight especially during the pandemic but back then it felt like I was never going back and it was like it felt like what you would be doing if you signed up for like for Elon Musk's first mission to Mars it was yeah. definitely a, it felt like a one-way ticket is that when your interest in martial arts and sort of arose I think I've always been interested in martial arts because many, many boys are. Right. <laughs> right. Just rough housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I got I grew interested in becoming strong way before I was interested in practicing and learning how to do martial arts. Mainly from being beat on a lot and being bullied. That'll do um, it. That'll do it, mm-hmm. right? It was more like street fighting, therefore that's why Street Fighter was probably one of my favorite games as well. Uh, also, they had that on they had that on the PlayStation. Street Fighter versus Capcom. <laughs> and then I didn't officially. I got into martial arts. I got into the like standardized practice of learning martial arts and uh, doing a deep dive into it fairly late in life. I would say I would say by the end of high school. 
is when I started taking on a lot of different sports. And it was through probably a graduation trip to Thailand when I saw people practicing Muay Thai. I uh, really took to it, took a few classes and loved it while I was in Thailand. And from then on, it was just an endless exploration. Did you ever go see a Muay Thai match while you were in Thailand? Oh, I did. I So then I moved back, I, I went back to Thailand Three years later, I lived there for a year practicing Muay Thai, and I I saw lots of fights, lots of amazing fights in Lupini and Bangkok, in, in Chiang Mai, and then I fought in a whole bunch of fights myself as well. In fact, as we're talking right now, I just got back from Thailand again after after a few years away from it. I got back about a month ago, finishing a Muay Thai film in Thailand. Is that coming out this year, or can you not talk about it? I can't officially talk about it. Okay. You're probably the first person I've spoken to about it, but it should be uh, maybe not this year because time flies. We're nearing the end of the year. I just oh, finished. Yeah. So they have to go through. They have to go through post. So it'll probably be next year. I'm still thinking it's like February or something, you know. But we're almost to the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. where. Where are you, by the way? I'm in South Carolina on the east coast of the U.S. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, that, that's a cool. That's a cool place. I've got a friend from South Carolina. I was in Alabama a couple of years ago doing another film. Really cool part of the United States. Yeah, it's hot as hell too. So before you said that you're, you know, a big fan of comics and anime. What were some of your go tos growing up? When I was growing up, my comics were manga. I, I didn't know Western comics until I really, I really came here. I didn't really read much comics um, when I was in Australia. I still stuck to my manga because I think one of the only things I carried with me from Hong Kong to Australia was um, my collection of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Z. So yeah, that was definitely one of my favorites. But they were wildly expensive. You can imagine they were really, really expensive manga back then to purchase, especially uh, to a little kid. Yeah. Um, it was like. Uh, trying to get my mom to buy me one was asking for the moon. <laughs> it was so expensive. I had to really scrape everything together to to get a few books, and I would read them over and over again. So Dragon Ball Z was definitely one. Ranma one and a half. I don't know if uh, you, many people know about it. I'm not but familiar it's, with that. One. It's one of the most hilarious manga I've ever read in my life. In terms of today's today's you know framework and society it might be pretty ahead of its time because it was about this it was about this martial arts master a young martial arts master he was training with his father in a remote region of china and in in that place they had these little i guess wells natural wells mm. that were cursed because different things have fallen into these wells and died and then after that whoever falls into the well would take on that curse. What, what would happen was if a person were to fall into that well and if they got out, if they get cold water poured on them, they would turn into whatever died in that well before. So the whole story is about this martial, young martial arts master. He falls into a well where a young girl had died. And then so from then on, anytime he gets cold water on him, he would turn into a young girl. Uh, it's a really old manga, but then it was hilarious because the father fell into a well where a panda died and uh, he would turn into a panda, a kung, fu fucking, a kung fu panda, literally. Has that ever been adapted to a show, do you know? So in Japan, there's a system of, man uh, of how the media works, right? Usually first people draw a manga, a comic series. And then if that gets popular in one of their magazines, if there's a series of graphic novels, then they would make it into an anime automatically. So it's like manga, anime, and then OVAs, which were like movies out of those animes. It would be like that. So yeah, that was made into a cartoon um, or an anime uh, quite a few years back. I don't think it's been turned into live action because that's quite a recent thing. Have you watched the show at all? Yeah. Did yeah. It, crack, it, did no, they do a good crack. job of adapting it? Yeah. Yeah. They always do. It's always because manga is on paper and cartoon is basically a lot of paper put together. And it's like they're really faithful to the original. So if you like the manga, you usually would like the anime. But of course, live action is a different story because we're all human and actors are, actors are flawed. <laughs> we're just not as good at, <laughs> as playing cartoon characters as we should be. I'm going to have to check that out. Man. What was the name of that one again? Rama One and a Half. It's like R A N M A One Half. It's hilarious, man. You'll love it. Gotcha. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Those are some classics. But of course, like in recent days, like Full Metal Alchemist, Death Note, 
Bleach and all that. Those are great. And then a huge fan of like all sorts of Western comics as well. A lot of Marvel stuff. Like the the side the offshoots I really like. Like Marvel Zombies. I love or, the offshoots. Yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the offshoots are great. Like the Ultimates, Vertigo Comics. A lot of like the Alan Watts, like that sort of. You know. Yeah. I love Vertigo Comics. I have a. I don't know if you can see, but I have a John Constantine tattoo on my arm here. Oh, and that's very whoa, cool. that's mad. Let's come back in really interesting ways. Have you seen what's on Netflix recently? Sandman. It's on my watch list. I've heard great things. Oh, it's great, man. There's there's a bit about there's some allusion to Constantine in there. Really? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay. you'll like it. When did you become interested in snowboarding and scuba diving? I think snowboarding was one of the first sports that got me into sports. This is really interesting my allegiance according to sports flip-flopped a lot so when i first got into sports it was rollerblading because all my friends got into this thing called aggressive rollerblading which is a really funny way to put it because <laughs> aggressive and rollerblading aren't two words you put together it sounds so, terrifying <laughs> yeah it was like doing tricks on rollerblading you know like like going off ramps and doing flips and and grind and also wearing baggy clothing so although like the style was very similar but aggressive rollerbladers always had a feud with skateboarders it's just like skiers and snowboarders you know so then when i was aggressive rollerblading i was hating on skateboarders a lot <laughs> you know that teenage angst you just have to have something to fight against right right and then and then, and then i started skateboarding so that was a bit of like cultural confusion again it's like am i supposed to hate on aggressive rollerbladers now at the end of the day, I just realized it was all just good and fun. So I got, I did skateboarding. I learned to snowboard. I learned to surf. And then from then on, scuba diving was one of my great loves. Uh, I picked up later on in life. And that's also something that has to do with Thailand because I lived on this island called Koh Tao where um, everyone scuba dived. There's so many scuba diving schools and you can go out every single day. And that's where I got my dive masters, which is uh, one of the higher levels of scuba diving. And just to explore the whole different world down there, it's, it's really the best. That meant a lot, great lot to me because I'm, a, I'm actually a terrible, terrible swimmer. In oh. fact, the other day I was out paddle boarding um, and I, I fell over and swallowed a whole bunch of water just, <laughs> just trying to get back to my board and not die. Have you ever had a, a scary situation with scuba diving? Any kind of shark yeah. encounters or anything? Uh, shark encounters aren't usually scary. Like they're exciting, but they're not that scary. I haven't done one of these, like a cage dive with a great white shark. I imagine that to be absolutely frightening. <laughs> The good thing is you're in the water, so if you pee your pants, it could just, <laughs> nobody will notice. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I've had some close calls where our oxygen gauge was, was faulty and uh, running out of air underwater is a really, really scary thing because you're sucking, you're sucking, and all of a sudden you would just stop and you can't breathe anymore. And then, you know, the whole panic system right. sets in your mind. Yeah, I think all sports come with risks. You just have to be aware and mitigate those risks. Running into those situations actually help you to stay exceptionally calm under really difficult situations. Since you're already in the martial arts, that probably already sort of helps you prepare for a sort of situation where you're kind of screwed, I guess. Yeah, and when that comes up is really when you start to panic. And that's the worst thing you can do for yourself. I've had a couple of near-death experiences in my life. And going through those has really taught me that if you panic, it's really over. Right. Well said. So at what point along your acting path did you realize, holy shit, I could do this for a career? Where it seemed real. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still realizing that, actually. <laughs> I've always had a rule that when I start something new, I try to think whether I can do this for life, whether it'll keep my interest for my entire lifetime. If it can't, if the answer is no, then I usually don't do it because what's the point of doing something and just quitting? At this point, I still think that acting and getting into film is something that I could work at but never perfect for my entire lifetime. So that's really interesting to me. So I'm still realizing that. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm making ends meet, putting food on the table, doing what I enjoy, being able to care for and provide for my loved ones. And that's all I need, really. Right. How does your first professional screen role happen for you? Was it a typical audition, right place, right time situation? My first professional screen role. I think this is my first. 
And it was an audition, and I wouldn't say it was typical because I because casting directors back when you do auditions in person, casting directors usually don't get into the swing of things. They just sit there and they have someone to act it out or read for you. But this person really got into it. Like he really got into my face and started like rubbing my head, which was bizarre because I remember him being just completely bald. And I don't know if that is appropriate or what. I don't think it works in the industry anymore. It was weird. So then I got cast. I, I actually got the role afterwards. And it was just a tiny role on, I think it was on some show on YTV, which is like a kid, like children programming here in Canada. And then it was just I'm not even sure I had any lines, but I was overjoyed at getting it, even after that bizarre and somewhat frightening experience. And it just grew from there. Mm -hmm. And now that I look back with with the type of roles that I'm getting today, it just seems um, it's incomparable what we're doing now. But the sense of joy at getting the chance to portray something and Mm -hmm. acting on screen and show it to the audience is still the same. I know you mentioned earlier that your mom was sort of trying to dissuade you. How did she react when you did get your first job? Was she was she happy or was she kind of discouraged by it? That first job, she didn't even know. When I chose acting in university, I didn't even tell her. And then when she found out, that's when she she told me I had to I had to quit and go into medicine. So I had to take both. But she didn't even know. She didn't know I was working officially as an actor until I did Power Rangers. And that was filmed in Vancouver, where she lives. And uh, she didn't even believe it. And my family didn't believe it until um, I took her on set one day and she saw all the lights and the trucks. And, and then she quickly realized that this was, this was a real thing. But of course, shortly after, she forgot about it because after that's done, there's no guaranteed second role. Right. You know, in acting, you roll the dice every single time that you finish a job, right? There's never a guarantee. So you just have to always work on your craft and get better. Mm-hmm. You're obviously very physically active and you try to stay in shape. Do you try to do your own stunts if possible? Yeah, on this most recent film, I'm actually really proud to say I did all of my own stunts. Uh, yeah, it was difficult. Stuntmen do not have an easy job. No. <laughs> um, I, I really, I really do what I can and I don't have too many role models in my life. I never had ever since I was growing up. It was more of trying to figure my way, own way out of things. As I grow older in life, ironically, a lot of people have popped up and I go, wow, if I could do that, that would be something I should aim toward that. And uh, I have to say Tom Cruise in the recent years really has been a great role model of course like doing your own stunts like jackie chan has always been talented but yeah there's people that somehow get this resurgence of energy and just watching top gun and possibly the upcoming mission impossible and hearing about all the stories and (laughs) what what he's willing to take on and just dive in head first seems like seems like a lot of fun and even even being able to keep my body up in shape and and my mind sharp enough to be able to do that for that extent extended period of time seems like something that i would want to uh it'd be a worthy challenge yeah man that tom cruise he's pretty good i've heard (laughs) have you seen top gun have you seen the latest i haven't seen the newest one oh that's good man you should see it i've heard nothing but great things about that and you know yeah. he's always he's like 60 years old jumping out of planes and stuff still so yeah 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 that's the, the least of it like it, like flying the plane and then probably jumping out of it trapped on the outside of the plane and jumping out of it that's nuts so i think we're about the same age you know i was born in 90 i think that's about the same time you were born were you a fan of the mortal kombat franchise growing up yeah, those were some of my, I mean, it, it's the first video game that really, I think I think it was Mortal Kombat and one other video game that actually made the video game system carry the ratings because it was so violent. Of course, there's some political stuff in it, but like that was one of the first games. And as everybody knows, the more you try to prevent kids from playing something, the more they want to play something, mm-hmm. right? As soon as you slap an R rating on a movie, that's when... Um, you know, 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds try to figure out what, uh, ways to sneak into the theater so they can watch it. And Mortal Kombat was one of those for video games. It's just a lot of fun. And the first time, like when you do a fatality, like when that comes up, it, it really, it does something. It yeah. does something. 
it does something like it makes you it makes you giggle and makes your I, I don't know if it's the same with boys and girls but as you know growing up as a boy and I, I know it makes something in, inside of you go a little bit giddy a little bit wild did you watch the first movie at all when it came out i did watch the first movie yeah i did i watched it quite a few times probably it was one of those that i put on replay yeah it was great first movie i think one of my favorite characters back then was reptile actually because that chameleon factor i always liked and it really blended into the ninja aspect of thing favorite character was always luke kang because of course. he's Wonder. just so overwhelmingly powerful to the extent where it was really cheap yeah, and you know, if you picked Luke Kang in the games, all your friends sort of rolled their eyes. Like, yeah, oh, you're yeah, picking yeah. Luke Kang again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was funny about that is one of my first episodes that I did on this show. We're over 150 episodes now. But one of my first ones was Robin Shu, yeah. who was Luke Kang oh, really? in the first movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. That's, when did you do that? That was like two and a half years ago, man. And it was like, oh, uh, really? Yeah. That's what I was gonna say. You know, it's kind of cool talking to you because I've kind of come full circle with the show with the Liu Kings. That's great. Yeah, because I, I I did speak to Robin quite a bit when the movie was going on, and he's just he's just a great person. I could really yeah. see him being. He gave me a lot of inspiration. I mean, not just the original Liu Kang, but him himself as a person gave me a lot of inspiration for how Liu Kang should be portrayed. That's why I always say that whenever you take on a role, especially an iconic one that that is so indelible it really it always leaves something in you as a person here it's definitely left something really deep within me uh, when we spoke with robin and i asked him about you know when he realized the big deal that mortal kombat was he almost started crying when he told the story about uh when he walked out of the main theater for the premiere and they had uh, invited thousands of kids without telling him and yeah. as soon as he walks out of the theater he's stormed by thousands of kids you know in Liu kang costumes i have wanted to have him sign their games and stuff and wow he just got overwhelmed telling that story and that's just wow i was gonna ask you when did you realize that Liu kang is a big deal i mean obviously you grew up with mortal kombat unlike him so it's a different thing i've been fortunate enough to have several of those, those moments in my life during rangers that was huge and Mortal Kombat, even even during the pandemic, where we weren't able to do the press tour, like have a have an actual premiere, which I promise we will do in Mortal Kombat 2. But even then, I really felt it from the outpouring from fans online, um, people like you requesting interviews and, yes. and telling me about you know your stories and how how much you loved Mortal Kombat and its history with you. And then I was able, like, I, I was doing a film in Hawaii at the time when Mortal Kombat came out. And funnily enough, the, that week when I was in Hawaii, the theaters opened up again. And so we just quietly went to the theater and watched Mortal Kombat. And then the owner noticed that, you know, the guy that's in the, in the, in the seats is the guy on the screen. So she, out of nowhere, it was just a little, like, almost a family mom and pop's theater shop. Yeah. But they, from somewhere, they, they, um, they conjured up this red carpet. This is tiny little, like, six-foot red carpet, you know? <laughs> And they laid it out after after we watched the film. And that was great. Even then there was fans like yeah. I think there was a seven year old girl in the in the audience. I don't know if she knew what she was watching <laughs> because she was having a birthday party that day. <laughs> She, she came to the theater and, and the family chose Mortal Kombat of all of all things. It just tells you what a great like family activity and a tradition going to the theaters are yeah. and, and how much these characters mean to people. Exactly. I say the same thing about your Mortal Kombat film that I said about the original, which is everybody's going to have their opinions about movies, specifically video game movies. But what you have to nail is the same thing that the first one nailed when, is what you guys nailed. It's Mortal Kombat. So you have to nail the casting. You have to nail the fights and you have to nail the brutality. And yeah. you guys checked all three boxes. And I just thought it was great. And I think you did a great job as Liu Kang. So I just wanted to say that to you just personally. Yeah, thanks, Justin. That means a lot, man. That means a lot. I mean, we were rebooting the movie after, what was it? I think 96 was the first one, right? Yeah, about that time. So that's, you know, that's like 20 something years, almost 30. And then I knew that the Mortal Kombat universe has grown so much in the time and evolved so much beyond what the what we had to work with in the originals. And there were things that we were going to get right and there were things that we were going to get wrong. And after the movie, in the final diagnosis, we were very aware and our director, Simon, he's very aware as well. And he even wrote a document saying, 
I think this is what we got right. This is where we could have done better. And this is where I want to go for the next movie. So he's had that. And now that he's officially on slate to direct the next movie, I think it's going to be great. I really look forward to it. How much did the pandemic affect you guys during filming or was that it was already done by then? Our, the bulk of our filming was done. The principal was done during right before the pandemic, actually. And then we had to do additional filming during the pandemic. And it was just a really different process because um, before the pandemic, everything was done, done on location. So there was very little CG involved in all the scenes and stuff. It was just, it was the outback of Australia where these great vast deserts were. And, and you know, Raiden's temple was actually an old mine. So it's like built into the ground, underneath the ground and everything was real. And then during additional photography, we had to we had to do it in studio just by the limitations of travel and stuff. So those are two vastly different experiences, but it's, you know, the show must go on. It's whatever it takes to get the job done. So moving on like past Mortal Kombat, I see that you're also a regular in the TV series Kung Fu. Now I've not watched it, but what can you tell me about it to sort of whet my appetite about it? It's a really different story. It's a, it's a reboot as well. It's um, Kung Fu is actually something, a treatment that Bruce Lee had originally wrote that turned into a, a TV series in the 70s called Kung Fu. But um, instead of casting Bruce Lee, they thought, you know, back then there were, there were limitations in diversity and representation, and they thought they needed a white person to be a lead. So it turned into a series featuring David Kerosene wandering around China trying to solve cases. There's huge fans of that, uh, mm -hmm. of that show back then actually really like my there's you know aunts that i talked to and you know the, the last generation that really still embrace that series but this one is a, a reboot taking place in our time in san francisco about a asian american girl taking the core of the martial arts that she's learned in china back to san francisco and solving things and discovering like unraveling mysteries around mythical things that happen in that world and along the way it's gotten more and more magical you're all about monsters and magic yeah um, of course along the, way the series there's more and more monsters and there's definitely more and more magic having said that i i've done I think because that's the first TV show I've ever done. And I really enjoy the process because you get to follow the character along, you know, along this journey for a very long time and a long arc. But I'm my time my time is done on that show since season two, which is the last season. And season three is filming right now and they're great. But um, I'm really happy where with where we left off with my character. His name is Kerwin. So if you guys check it out, yeah, let me know what you guys think because I'm always happy to hear. He definitely goes through, he, de he goes through the ringer. I'm definitely um, gonna check that out. I remember the Kung Fu show now that you remember. I didn't know it was based on that Kung Fu, that it was a reboot, yeah, I didn't know that. It's not based on it, but it's like a reimagining of it. It shares the name and it shares the, it shares the history. It's kind of like, humans like you and me and walruses we share a common ancestor way back then somewhere yeah. <laughs> but you know it's not like we're, we're based on the same anything yeah Do you know what i, mean? I got you <laughs> now you did star in one of my personal favorite shows speaking of monsters and magic and such black mirror and now i consider that sort of a modern day twilight zone what was your experience like working on that show black mirror that was so cool uh, first of all, I got to go to Brazil to work. Again, it's one of these things like, because this day and age, everyone just assumes everything that's cool on screen is CG. In my experience, we still try to do things as tangible as possible. So for Black Mirror, all the Japanese locations is actually set in Brazil because Brazil has one of the largest populations of Japanese people and Japanese culture outside of Japan. And all the towers and stuff, all the back setting, it's all there. Yeah, it, it was just great fun to do. Like the crew, super fun. Our director, Owen Harris, he's all about exploring this thing between virtual reality and relationships, mm. what love means in the future, in all these different context, uh, in all these different contexts. You know, he's got three episodes on Black Mirror, and they're all about that. They're all about what happens when love transcends the body yeah. into the digital space, right? And what it means for us in the future. So that was great. As soon as I read the script, it blew my mind, and I knew I want to sign on to the project. And fortunately enough, I got, I really got to do it. 
what a great show just in general you know i mean like i said i consider it the twilight zone of our generation because it touches on that kind of gray area between like where does technology cross the line into becoming a bit creepy you know so they're doing a new season now did you hear that um they didn't do a season for the last two years because the creators thought that the um <laughs> it was too much the world, the world was dark enough as it is yeah they didn't want, yes. <laughs> they didn't want to take away our <laughs> last shred of hope uh so consider it really uh, that just shows yeah. how good the show is that it can do that yeah. i, I yeah. appreciate if it they did it if they did it black mirror could have been the the straw that broke the camel's back yeah, it would have been over for us there's, there's covid monkey pox and then black mirror and it's just finished the nail in the coffin <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, Ludi, when you look back over all of the roles that you've done thus far, is there one that is most challenging, one that kept you up at night, maybe you pulled your hair over or something like that? I'm always, like, there's this concept of four center of mass, which means you're always pushing yourself a little bit forward, like 15 degrees forward every single time, because if you're not, then you either being stagnant or you're falling backwards. And I always want to lean forward a little bit just to push myself forward. So, which means naturally the next project is always going to be my toughest project because I'll be pushing my limits, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, whether it's what. But this latest project I finished in Thailand, that was really, really tough because I truly did 100% of my own stunts. And Thailand's hot, man. It's really, really, it's really, I don't know what, what temperature there is. Uh, it is in, in South Carolina right now, but, and far be it for me to try to do this in Fahrenheit, sorry, but we work in Celsius. So it was like 40 degrees in Thailand doing action for eight hours a day. Uh, 40 degrees, probably it's over a hundred for sure. Oh okay. yeah. That's so it was, yeah. So it was boiling hot. My body was just going crazy to the extent where it's so hot and you're so distracted by the exertion that you don't even notice the injuries that you get. You just want to keep pushing it and keep going after filming, go to sleep, get up in the morning, train, prepare, and then go to set and do that over and over again. And this, this Muay Thai film that I finished, it was a reimagination, very loosely, very, very loosely based on Enter the Dragon. That was a really challenging role, but it was so much fun. If you ask me right now whether I would do it again, I would say <laughs> maybe. Give, give me a few weeks before you ask me that question again. <laughs> okay. Um, but it really prepares me for Mortal Kombat 2, which is coming right up. How long was that shoot that you were just on, the to Muay Thai film? Uh, that was a little bit more than two months. So, have you seen any movies recently that have moved you? Oh, well, Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Top Gun. There's, you, you have to see it, man. It's the, it, I, I wouldn't say there's anything that will flip your world upside down. You know, when you, do you remember the feeling when you first saw The Matrix? Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, wow, okay. You knew it was something. Like sit, yeah, sit back for a few days, right? Top Gun, I wouldn't say it was like that, but it was like just every single aspect of movie making at its best. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah. not like a really revolutionary concept, but it's a step toward perfection of what that genre can bring. Um, so that was really cool. What else did I see? I saw, what was the last movie you watched in the theaters? Holy shit. It might have been something like the conjuring that long ago the conjuring yeah or part two of wow. the conjuring maybe um it's been that long since i've been to the theater what have you what have you been watching oh i thought i saw, I saw okay so with the with the movie i did in thailand two of my cast mates were local thais i actors with a, a whole bunch of them there was a lot of thai actors but three of them were in a recent movie called 13 lives made by ron howard about the 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 uh, children's soccer team that was trapped in a cave in Thailand yeah. back a few years ago. So there was a documentary called The Rescue, and Ron Howard made a a movie named Thirteen Lives, starring Viggo Mortensen uh -huh. and Colin Farrell and Joel Joel Egerton. It was it was really really good. And um, my friends who are in this uh, Muay Thai movie with me, they're Thai actors that take on various like really important roles. So I really enjoy that as well. It was it was it was a really good movie. Awesome. Is there anything that's on the horizon for you that you can tell us about without getting in trouble? So this this movie, I mean, the thing about the horizon is I'm always expecting the unexpected. So there's things that I know is going to happen, like Mortal Kombat 2 is going to happen. 
I'm preparing for that now, getting myself mentally and, and definitely physically there. There's movies that I want to produce and there's just like I produced this recent film in Thailand. I co-produced it, um, had a lot of creative input, which is so enjoyable. Um, so I want to explore that area to, to be able to produce the stories that I want to tell. And then what else? Just lots of paddle boarding. It's really <laughs> fun and calming. It's so like, it's like a meditation. Just enjoy the summer, enjoy life and friends. I hope you guys do too, because we had a lot of time just being like reclusive and shut in. And now um, the sun's out, bring the guns out. <laughs> exactly. It's time to go outside. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rudy, play. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to cut you loose. And if you just uh, while I got you here, if you're down, down the road, I'd love to have you and Robin together. Uh, oh, that'd be amazing. That'd try be crazy. To- yeah, I'd love to get you and Robin together after Mortal Kombat 2. I know he's down, so we'll see if we can get you two together. Yeah, definitely, man. Shout out anytime. Thank you for your time, Justin. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, have a good afternoon, mate. All right, bye-bye. So, yeah. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.